I hope you know the freedom and forgiveness in Jesus this morning. If you don't know the Jesus that we've been singing about this morning, then I want to assure you that there is freedom, there is forgiveness by trusting in His blood. I'm, I'm thankful today to know, like the song that we sang, there's power in the blood of Jesus. He can release us from our burdens. There was a time that I was burdened down in sin, but I'm thankful today that I'm free. Uh, the Bible says, whom the Son shall set free, he'll, he'll be free indeed. And I'm thankful today uh, that we don't have to live in bondage. You have a Bible with you. Turn to Romans chapter number 10 this morning. Just going to read a couple of verses, three, four, maybe five or twelve verses, something like that. Out of Romans chapter number 10. Blake, turn that down just a shade. Romans chapter number 10, Romans chapter number 10, Romans chapter number 10. Stand as you, uh, as we honor the reading of God's Word together this morning. The Bible says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness... And going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness under the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. Father, it is good to be here this morning. I'm very thankful for this good crowd has come. Lord, I'm thankful this morning for the sweet Holy Spirit that has been evident here in our midst this morning. God has already been some on the altar today that you've already uh, touched their heart, and I thank you for that. And Lord, I know that none of us know everything that you're doing in any heart, so I pray that, God, we would be obedient to you this morning. Whatever you want to do, God, whatever you need to do, I pray that we would respond accordingly. Lord, I have some remarks prepared that I uh, have uh, planned to make after studying this Scripture, but I know that my words are not nearly as important to your words. Help me to yield unto you this morning. God, I pray that you would speak to the heart of each and every believer that are gathered here today. Lord, I realize there's some that are struggling with needs right now. Some, uh, Lord, are hurting. Uh, some are going through a heartache. Father, you can provide comfort and peace, and I pray that you would touch them today. Lord, there are some that's going through a hardship, maybe that none of us knows about today. I pray that you would encourage them. Father, there are some in this room today, maybe that are lost. There are some like these Jews that are ignorant of the righteousness of God and are going about to try and establish their own righteousness. Lord, if there is even one person here like that today that's separated from you by sin in their life, I pray, Lord, that you would do what's necessary. Just touch, Lord, finger around their heart as, Lord, as you helped me preach this morning. God, I pray that you would just soften their heart, that uh, the gospel may be able to take root there, and that one would pass from death unto life in our presence. God, we ask you to do all these things, but we pray most of all today that Jesus would be lifted up in our presence today. That Lord, when we leave this place, we'd be able to say it's been good to be in the house of the Lord today and be able to rejoice that the name of Jesus has been exalted. But God, I pray that it wouldn't stop here within these walls Lord, that when we leave this place, that we would praise You by the way that we live and by the things that we say uh, out in our life, Lord, uh, the rest of the day and each and every day of our lives. Help us to remember that we are a living testimony to a lost and a dying world and that we may very well be the only Scripture that some folks ever read. So God, I pray you would impress upon our hearts the gravity of the situation. 
We've been talking about evangelism. Make it real to our hearts as only you can. Give us a burden for these souls that we may reach them in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. We've been going through this series, uh, Fired Up, and Fired Up, of course, an acrostic, of Fired Up uh, Evangelism. And I hope that you're getting fired up to lead somebody uh, to Jesus. I'm thankful there are some reports that, uh, that folk have led others to Christ. Just uh, here recently within our number, and I'm encouraged by that, I pray that... Uh, Each of us would be encouraged to share our faith with others. We talked about uh, the last few weeks about faithfulness and the best thing that you can do to lead somebody else to Jesus is to be faithful in your own life. We we talked about how that a believer is faithful in his ways. He is a a pattern of of right living. He is a pattern of of labor that he works on behalf of the Lord. We talked about a believer being faithful in his word being careful what he speaks, speaking the word of God, speaking the words of goodness, not speaking evil or, or foolishness. Uh, we talked about a believer being faithful in his, in his witness, living right, and how uh, that the adversary uh, cannot refute uh, our teaching or our testimony that nothing evil uh, should be able to be said about God's people. We talked about the example of our faithfulness, how uh, the, the, the reputation of the faithful is seen in our, our walk, our wisdom, our worship. We talked about uh, the resistance to the faithful and you, you're going to encounter some resistance as you go out into the world. If you're trying to live for the Lord, you know there's going to be some resistance uh, to your stand. We talked about the resolve of the faithful. How that we resolve ourselves and we, uh, we purpose in our heart that we're going to do the right thing and that we don't wait uh, till the time that uh, that temptation faces us to make up our mind, but we're always going to do the right thing no matter what it may cost us. We have to make up our mind now what we're going to do. Are we going to stand for the Lord today? Or are we going to serve uh, self, sin, and Satan? So we resolve to, uh, we, we're purposed to, to resolve to follow God. We're patterned. We're, and, and we talked about how the resolve of the faithful is always very powerful. Again, lending credence to your words by the way that you live. Now, Today we're going to move forward. We've got uh, the F. Now we move on to the I. What we're talking about t- this morning uh, and tonight, Lord willing, is intercession. We sang the song this morning, Somebody Prayed for Me. How many of you in this room believe that somebody has prayed for you? I, I think you probably can all uh, raise your hand. In fact, I prayed for every one of you, so I know that somebody has. Undoubtedly, there are multiple people that have prayed for us on a maybe on a regular basis. If you know Jesus today, I, I dare say that somebody prayed for you to be saved. I, I don't believe I know a single soul that's ever come to know Christ unless somebody had prayed for them. And you know, you and I, if we plan, if we plan to witness to somebody, if our intention is to lead them to Jesus, then we first ought to intercede on their behalf. We ought to bathe that in prayer. We ought to pray that God would get a hold of their heart even before we began to share the Word of God with them. We ought to pray that God would do a work in our heart. We prayed a minute ago that God would soften every heart in the room so that the gospel would be able to take root. That's what we need to do every day. God, when I run into a lost person, I want you to open their heart so that I may have opportunity to share with them the Word of God. Nobody can get saved unless the Holy Spirit is dealing with them. Unless unless He has broken that heart. So if God doesn't initiate, then it won't do us any good to try and force the gospel on them. So we pray that God will begin to deal with hearts. That lost person, your neighbor, your friend, your family member, your your co-worker, you got on, their, on, on your heart, listen, 
live faithfully and pray for them and look for the opportunity. Now, Paul said here, I want to share three things we get from this scripture this morning and be very quick and then I'll be done. But looking at Paul, and, and I want to share with you to, uh, this morning, interceding for the wayward. Tonight, I'm going to share with you interceding for the witness. So we're going to pray uh, for the wayward tonight, those that are lost. And then tonight, uh, we're going to talk about interceding for, I could have called it the worker instead of the witness, one or the other. How can we pray for the lost? How should we pray for the lost? How should we pray for the witness? How should we pray for the worker? Now, number one, Paul says here, he said, brethren, my heart's desire, look at verse number one, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is this, that they might be saved. So uh, prayer starts with a burden. That's the first thing. Prayer starts with a burden. Paul had a burden for his countrymen. Now, how many of you realize that that Paul is called the he's called uh, the uh, the the apostle to the Gentiles, right? Uh, you know that that he is, of course, a a Jewish man. In fact, he's a Jew of Jews. Actually, probably a member of the elite Sanhedrin. But he is known as the apostle to the Gentiles. He he's a missionary to the Gentiles. But but, but he had a burden for his own people. He had a burden for his own countrymen. Many of you have a burden for your own family, your own friends, maybe uh, maybe your home church, or, or maybe folks that live close to you. God may have called you somewhere else, but you never lose that burden for those people. You, you see, they may not hear you. They may not receive your witness, but you have a burden. You see, Paul was burdened because of their condition. He, he knew their condition. How did how did Paul know what their exact spiritual condition was? Well, he understood what their condition was because he was just like them. He he used to be one that was just like them. When I see my lost and friends and family now, now that that seem to have no inclination toward the things of God, I can look at them and I know how they feel because once I was there, I had no inclination. I was lost and did not know. And he had a desire to reach these people. He was burdened by their condition. In fact, verse number two says there, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge. Now, the Jews had a lot of knowledge. You understand that as you read the Bible. They, they studied the Bible. They memorized the scripture. In fact, every Jew was very well versed in the scripture. They, they probably had more biblical knowledge than, than, than anybody there's ever been. This group of people, and you think, how could they not worship God according to knowledge? How could they not know God according to knowledge? But but they, you see, the knowledge that they had actually was, I guess maybe it was kind of misconstrued or misplaced. They, they thought that they could keep the law. They thought that it was uh, uh, the giving of the law, the, the keeping of the law that would make them righteous. They, they were ignorant of the righteousness of God. They, they, and, and Paul was burdened by their condition. You, you see, there was their insistence that they could keep the law. Matthew 23 says, One to you, scribes and Pharisees, Jesus said this, Hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and, and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment and mercy and faith, these ought, ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides would strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, for within they are full of extortion and excess. And thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter that the outside of them may be clean also. So you see, he was burdened by their condition. Their, their insistence were that they were God's chosen people, that they were keeping the law, and there was nothing lacking in their relationship with God. Have you ever tried to witness to somebody that could not admit that there was anything amiss in their life? You, you ever heard anybody say, you've never been 
be really saved until you realize that you're lost. You, you can never be found unless you know that you're lost. Well, that's a condition these people were in. They thought that they were right with God. That, that's what they insisted. They, they thought that they were God's chosen people and they could not bring themselves to believe that God would cast them aside. That God, uh, that, that, that God would, not, uh, would not accept them as his chosen people. Now, in verse number 3 talks about their ignorance. It says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and go about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. You see, his, his prayer started with a burden. He was burdened because of, their, uh, because of their condition. They were insistent that there was nothing wrong. They were ignorant to the fact that there was nothing wrong. They were ignorant to the fact that they were unable to keep the law. They were ignorant to the fact that the law never was meant to save anybody. But the Bible says it was just a schoolmaster to show us our need for Christ. Now, they were ignorant to their own need. You know, if they had not been ignorant to the holiness and the righteousness of God, they would have been able to see their own uh, insufficiency. They would have been able to see their own unrighteousness. Do you know, if you ever really get a vision of God in His holiness, if you ever really get a vision of God in His righteousness, you'll get a picture of how un unholy and how unrighteous you are. You know our problem is many times like these Jews we look around us and we see other people and we think that well I'm at least as good as them or I'm probably better than them and we assume that God's going to accept a little bit of bad but that's not true. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump and listen if there's any bad in anybody then the whole is bad and God cannot accept that. He never goes by man's system of righteousness but his listen his standard is perfect his standard is holy and nothing less and if we get a vision of who he really is and how that he can't accept anything unholy anything unpure then we'll realize that something must be done in order for us to be accepted by God Amen. you know the closer you get to the Lord I, I've likened it to, to maybe a, a mirror and then, you know, you can stand, I can stand here, what am I, 15 feet from the wall, and I look pretty good in that mirror from here, maybe since I can't see that good without glasses, but once you get uh, uh, closer and closer to that mirror, you start to realize that you don't look quite as good, and once you get way up here, you begin to see all the little imperfections, you see all the little things that don't look uh, pleasing to the eye, and you know Christ is like that too, if you think you're pretty good, if you if you think that you're righteous, then you're probably a long way from the Lord because I tell you, He has a, a way of reflecting back at you what you really look like and the closer that you get to Him, the more you, you realize, oh, I'm ugly, I'm unrighteous, I'm, I'm impure, there's nothing good in me, nothing at all. And when you really see Christ for who He is, it drives you to your knees realizing that something must be done. Something must be done, thank God. But you see, he was burdened by their uh, he was burdened by their condition, and he was burdened about their conversion. If you would ask them if they were going to heaven, if they would be ex accepted of God, they would say, "Sure." How many people do you know today that you could ask if they were going to heaven when they die? that would say, well, yeah, sure. I plan, I plan to go to heaven. You know, somebody made a little joke one time and said, a lot of people say they don't believe in heaven. You ask them where they're going, they say they're going to heaven. But they, but they deny that there is one. One old preacher I knew, he said, uh, he said I never, uh, denied, never ever denied the reality of hell. In fact, I used to tell people that, that they was going there right often. Or wish they'd go there. But but you see, he was burdened by their conversion. He he wanted to see them saved. What did he say? Brother, my heart's desire. He said, my burden. And he said, to God for Israel is what? That they might be saved. Not that they might become religious. These people were religious. They had a system. And they, looking from the outside, they looked like some really 
good people. In fact, Jesus said that. He said all that the, the Pharisees bid you do, do. But, but don't be a hypocrite. Don't, don't miss the, the heart of the law. You see, He wanted to see them saved. He wanted to see them submit themselves unto God. Verse number 3 said, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Of God. By what is the righteousness of God? Receiving Jesus Christ by faith. They didn't realize that they needed anything. Submitting themselves to God, you see, believing by faith. Look down at verse number nine. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt what? Believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be what? Say. If you believe in your heart, Listen, confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, that thou shalt be saved. He was burdened about their condition. He was burdened about their conversion. So he prayed about that. He, he needed them to realize that the only way that they could ever be accepted of God was just like everybody else based on the blood of Jesus. That was the only way that they would go. Verse number 12 says, There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. The Jew thought they were good. They thought they had something. They thought that they were God's chosen people. But what he's saying is your righteousness is going to send you to hell. You need the blood of Jesus just like the Gentiles do. <laughs> you see, prayer starts with a burden. I began to think about this and what he's saying. And You know, if you really get into the context of the the text that we're looking at this morning, who he's praying for. He's praying for, he's praying for people that despised him. He's praying for people that hated the ground that he walked on. That really were, were ultimately, we'll talk about that a little later, but they, they were trying to kill him. You know, and I, I thought, how does, he, how does he pray for them? Because I'd probably be a little bit bitter about that, wouldn't you? You know, when people mistreat you, and I've never had anybody stone me. I, I've never had anybody beat me with rods. Maybe they beat me with a belt when I was little, but it wouldn't cause my faith. Probably didn't beat me enough. But um, you, you, it would be hard for me to imagine that he wouldn't somewhat bitter. And I, I began to think about that. And I, I, I come up with this, and I, and I thought, and I believe it's from the Lord. You know, it's hard to... Hard to be bitter against the man you're praying for. It's hard to get down on your knees and pray for somebody to be saved and hold bitterness in your heart against them. That prayer has a power to change you. And I, I kept thinking about that and I thought this, you know, if there's somebody that you know that you can't pray for, something ain't right in your relationship. With the Lord. Is there a single solitary soul that you couldn't honestly get on your knees and pray for God to help them and love on them the way that Paul did? And I thought about that, Brother Tyler, and I thought, well, you know what? Prayer squashes bitterness. You know, not only does it start with a burden, but it, it squashes bitterness. Who's he praying for? Well, he said, my, my heart's desire, in verse number one, and prayer to God for Israel is they might be saved. It, there's always, and I thought about this group of people, and I thought about him, and you know, everywhere that somebody gets saved, there's always friction between a believer and a non-believer. Do you know that? There's always some friction there. They will never fully accept you. You, you see, he had the potential for bitterness because he was hated by these Jews. They hated him because of what he said. But Acts 9 says straightway, speaking of him, uh, speaking of Paul, 
It says straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God, but all that heard him were amazed and said, Is this not he that destroyed them which called on his name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound to the chief priest? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. He was hated by these Jews because he denounced their system of religion. He said, your system of religion is going to deliver you not to heaven, but your system of religion is going to deliver you to hell. You know, probably we'd have said today, you got to be careful how you handle these religious people because you, you want to be careful that you don't push them away. You know, I guess there's some truth in that because we all encounter some religious people. You know, I've encountered some religious people that I believe didn't have Jesus as their Savior. You know, and Paul was pretty bold in the way that he spoke to them. He told them about their need for Jesus. And they, they didn't want to hear that. He was hated by the Jews. He was hunted by the Jews. In fact, they, they followed him around. And they caused a ruckus. They caused a stir everywhere he went because they didn't like his message. They, they stirred up the crowds against him. And in Acts 14 too, it says, But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil, afflicted, or affected against the brethren. So, so you see that, that Paul's potential for bitterness, but you also find Paul's prescription for bitterness was prayer. He prayed for them. That's how he dealt with the problem that they gave him. He had a, he had a genuine concern for, for them. How do you know that? Well, he said that. Back up to chapter number 9. Look with me, verse number 1. He said, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. He sorrowed over them because of their lost condition. He wanted them to turn to Christ and to be saved. He had a genuine, he had a genuine burden for them. And he went on to say, for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren my kinsmen according to the flesh he said for the Jews to be saved he said if it were possible and it's not he said I would go to hell I would cast off the faith if it were possible for them to be saved now it's not you can't save anybody and if you're saved I don't believe you can lose it and that's not possible but he said if there was any way he said if I could choose I'd go to hell that they could be saved you know, you probably, that, I'm telling you, that's a heart for people. And that's a heart for people that hated him. You probably think about some people today that, that if they get saved, you, you wish you could go to hell in their place. If they get saved, you probably love somebody that much. But I bet it's somebody in your family. I bet it's one of your close friends. Probably not somebody that hates you. Probably not somebody that stirs up strife around you all the time. That's the kind of man that he was. Are we concerned for our enemies? You, you have some examples of that in the Scripture. You certainly have uh, Jesus on, on the cross. And He's saying, Father, as they're actively engaged in killing Him, He's saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You have Stephen when they're stoning Him and He's saying, Lord, lay not their sin to their charge. And then you have Paul who is eventually going to be martyred for, uh, for his faith in Jesus by this same group of people. And He's saying it, my heart's desire is that they might be saved. And he said, if I could, I'd be a curse so they could be saved. That's something only Jesus can do, ain't it? You see, prayer not only squashes bitterness, it starts with a burden, but in verse number 1, we see again there, uh, he said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. You, you find that prayer stems from belief. Why would you pray for a lost person? You believe that God can save them. Why would you not pray for a lost person? Stands to reason on the flip side that you don't really believe God can save them. If you really have a concern for them, and you really believe that God would save them, can save them, wouldn't you pray for them? I mean, it stands to reason, doesn't it? 
If I really believe that and I really have a concern for them, then it's obviously one of two things. Either I'm not concerned about them, so don't pray for them. I'm self-absorbed, wrapped up in myself, so I'm not praying. Or I just plain out don't believe God and safe. How about you? It's pretty callous. You see, prayer stems from a belief. Paul believed that God could save. Hebrews 7 says, Wherefore He is able also to save them to the uttermost and come unto God by Him, seeing He ever liveth to make intercession for them. You see, even the most wicked sinner can be saved. Paul believed that because he saw himself as the most wicked sinner that had ever lived. You know, if we really saw ourselves as the most wicked sinner that was er ever lived, we probably would begin to pray like we believe God could save others around us. Right. You know, there's a lot of people I know that's lost ain't near as wicked as I was. That lives a whole lot better probably than I did. And I, I think, you know, we sang that song, Somebody Prayed For Me. I think really Paul... I think he never did get over Stephen's prayer. The Bible says he was there, consented to the death of Stephen. And, and, and the Bible says that Stephen called on the Lord. He said, Lord, not, lay not this sin to their charge. And I think that Paul saw something in him that all the trappings of religion could never bring him. He saw a genuine heart. He saw Jesus living in that man. And I, I think it haunted him until the Damascus Road. I'm not sure how much time had elapsed there. But I don't believe that Saul, Paul, I don't believe he ever really got over that fact that Stephen prayed for him. You believe God can save people? Why don't you get on your knees and pray for them? If we're going to see people get saved, we've got to first bathe it in prayer. We've got to go to God. And that, you know why? Because I can't do it. I can't save them. And you can't save them. Boy, if I could, I'd lay my hand on everybody. You're saved. You're saved. I'd be wasting my time. Only God can save. Do you pray like you believe you can?